Eight made no play. What's up, family? It's your boy Danny back alive and in the flesh, reminding you once again that you're beautiful enough, you're strong enough, and you're capable enough, which means you're good enough. And you're gonna stay that way because you're gonna eat meat, move weight, and give blood. That's right, phlebotomy. Now, today we're gonna talk about iron. It's history, it's biochemistry, it's physiology, it's essentiality, iron absorption, iron homeostasis. We're gonna talk about food fortification. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about a couple of things or a few things that'll help both broccoli heads and meat eaters maintain iron homeostasis. After watching this video, there's no way that our vegan family is ever gonna be able to credibly insist that we aren't specifically adapted for meat eating ever again. So I'm gonna need you guys to strap in because this one's gonna be a slightly long, slightly wild ride. From ancient times, man has recognized the special role that iron plays in both health and disease. Iron had early medicinal uses for the Hindus, the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Romans. However, it was not until 1932 that the essentiality of iron was finally settled by a convincing proof of the necessity of inorganic iron for hemoglobin synthesis. Now, in contrast to zinc, iron is actually an abundant element. It is in fact, by mass, the most abundant element on earth. Despite its geologic abundance, low iron intake still accounts for most of the anemia in developed nations and almost half of the anemia in developing nations. But this paradox, that of geologic abundance, coupled with low dietary intake is pretty easily explained. Iron, when it comes into contact with oxygen, uh, forms iron oxides or rust. And these iron oxides are highly insoluble and thus not readily available for uptake by living organisms. Iron participates in a wide variety of metabolic processes, some of which are absolutely critical, including oxygen transport, oxygen reduction reactions, electron transport, and DNA synthesis. So what do we know? We know that iron is an essential dietary nutrient for human beings. We know that because of its reactivity, it's hard for iron to work its way up the food chain and it's hard for us to absorb. Thirdly, we know because of the very same properties that make it hard to absorb its reactivity with oxygen, it can be dangerous to store it in the human body. And lastly, despite that fact, because it's hard to absorb, the human body doesn't want to let it go. Now, there are only two types of absorbable dietary iron. There's heme iron and there's non-heme iron. Now the heme iron that we absorb in our diets, we absorb from animal food sources. We find it specifically in the flesh of red meat, poultry, fish, and shellfish. More than 95% of the functional iron in the human body is heme iron. So no heme means no oxygen transport, no oxygen storage, no metabolism, and no life. Non-heme iron is found primarily in plant foods. However, it is also the kind of iron that's in dairy and eggs and it actually makes up half of the iron that's in meat. Non-heme iron is also found in America in iron fortified foods, which we're gonna talk about a little later. Now, historically, scientists actually doubted that the enterocytes were even capable of absorbing heme iron. Now we know for a fact that heme iron is actually the most readily absorbed form of iron and preferentially absorbed over non-heme iron. Consequently, foods with the highest iron content aren't necessarily the best sources of iron. For instance, by weight, soybeans have approximately twice the iron of beef, but only about 7% of the iron in soybeans is absorbed. Additionally, spinach has very high iron content, but only about 2% of the iron in cooked spinach is absorbed. So this preferential absorption plays itself out like this. Between 15 to 35% of the heme iron that we ingest is absorbed, while only between five to 12% of the non-heme iron that we ingest is absorbed. Because of this difference in absorption, studies estimate that in Western societies, iron derived from heme sources, that is animal flesh, make up two thirds of the average person's total iron stores. Now this is despite the fact that uh, iron derived from heme sources, read animal flesh, only makes up one third of the total amount of ingested iron of the average person. Taken all together, what this means is that heme iron is a special kind of iron found nearly exclusively in animal flesh. Now, most people won't even qualify it. They'll just say that heme iron is exclusively found in the flesh of animals, but I wanna leave it qualified because we're gonna talk about a really awesome exception 
to this rule later in the video that our vegan family should definitely stick around for to find out about and should definitely take advantage of. So what do we know now? We know that dietary iron is an essential nutrient but tricky to absorb for human beings. Secondly, we know that heme iron is a special kind of iron found nearly exclusively in animal flesh and that it's preferentially absorbed by the human body. And lastly, we know that this the way that the body absorbs or this preferential absorption of iron likely explains why we see iron deficiency diseases in vegans and vegetarians and iron overload diseases in meat eaters. So why though, for the average person, despite constituting only one third of the total iron ingested, does heme iron, or iron derived from heme sources, constitute two thirds of a person's uh, total body iron stores? That is. Why is heme iron preferentially absorbed or absorbed more so than non-heme iron in a human body? Well, that's because there are specialized, specific, and possibly energy intensive pathways in the small intestine that exist exclusively for the absorption of heme iron, which is found nearly exclusively in the hemoglobin and myoglobin that's found exclusively in animal flesh. Yeah! Do I need to repeat that? Now, this is one of the clearest pieces of evidence, if not the clearest, that you're ever gonna get, that the human body is specifically and specially adapted for meat eating. In my opinion, it is irrefutable and undeniable. Now, the authors of this study, uh, while phrasing this a lot more diplomatically, uh, essentially agree with me when they state that heme iron should be considered an essential nutrient for the human body. Besides the exception that I promised our vegan family we talk about later, which didn't even exist when this study was written, this could have only meant that animal flesh should be considered an essential nutrient for the human body. We still need to be careful. Uh, iron concentrations in body tissue still need to be tightly regulated, and that's because although iron deficiency is a fairly common condition, um, it is not the only extreme of the spectrum that we must avoid. Now, unlike with most other metals, uh, the body regulates iron homeostasis at the point of absorption rather than the point of excretion. Now, iron excretion is an unregulated process that is arrived at through the loss of iron in sweat, menstruation, uh, the shedding of hair and skin cells, and the rapid turnover and excretion of enterocytes. Now, iron in excess of the body's needs is stored as serum ferritin. However, the body has a limited uh, ability to store that. Um, so then it starts storing iron as hemosiderin. And then there's also a limited ability of the body to properly store hemosiderin, at which point the body starts depositing the extra in the heart, liver, and the endocrine organs like we talked about earlier. Eventually, organ failure and or death occur. So what do we know now? We know that iron is essential but tricky to absorb. We know that heme iron is a special kind of iron that is found nearly exclusively in the flesh of animals and that it's preferentially absorbed by the human body. We know that the differences in the way that heme iron and non-heme iron are absorbed are probably responsible for why we see iron deficiencies in vegetarians and vegans and iron overload in meat eaters. We know that iron is absorbed at the point of absorption unlike other metals because the human body has a limited ability to excrete iron. We know that excess iron is stored in the body as serum fer or as ferritin and hemosiderin, but we know because of the dangerous and reactive nature of iron that this storage of excess iron can be absolutely detrimental to human health as bad for you as an iron deficiency can be, if not worse. Too little will make you sick and kill you. Too much will make you sick and kill you. Man, nutrition is hard. Fortification was a worldwide or global effort um, an attempt to stamp out iron deficiency diseases, diseases like anemia, and it was an understandable obsession. Widespread fortification of flour began in the United States in the 1930s. The tipping point in the iron fortification debate came in 1978 when an eminent physician and scientist named William Crosby published a paper in the JAMA called The Safety of Iron Fortified Food. He argued that although there are some groups at risk of anemia, such as pregnant women, um, adding iron to the food supply in general exposes many who are not at risk of iron deficiency to the risk of iron overload. Now, it was a provocative idea at the time, this idea of iron overload, but the evidence came or manifested itself in the very year 1978 that his paper came out. Researchers in Sweden found evidence of rapidly increasing rates of early stage hemochromatosis in men. 
and just admit. Hemochromatosis is a iron overload condition that in its later stages kills by heart attack or cancer due to the deposition of excess hemosiderin in the heart and liver. This is exactly how the standard American diet kills people, heart attack and cancer. Iron fortification of food in Sweden was actually the highest in the world until they ended up outlawing it in 1995. At this point, Denmark doesn't even allow the importation of iron fortified breakfast cereals due to the harm that they might cause people. Iron overload can account for all the sickness and disease that cholesterol or meat eating allegedly account for in the finger pointing game that vegans play. Iron overload can account for the differential rates in cardiovascular disease between men and women, but it can also account for the rise in CBD rates that we see in postmenopausal women. Iron uh, can actually account for why during the first, I don't know, three to eight weeks of <clears throat> pregnancy, um, women actually uh, have a reduced capacity to absorb iron and why they can't stand the smell of meat, which is really just a marker for heme iron, especially red meat. Um, it can account for the fact that breast milk has very little iron in it. It accounts for all of the facts very parsimoniously. Now, what all this means, passe vegans, is that carnivorousness or carnivory is not the exclusive or defining trait of the standard American diet. However, I don't think we should be too hard on vegans here because iron overload, right, and sickness caused by overload uh, tend to be very neatly, tightly correlated with meat eating. Vegans should be pointing their fingers then at iron overload rather than cholesterol or meat eating or anything else. And they should be pointing their finger at fingers at specifically at iron overload as a consequence of eating the standard American diet, which includes as a legislative cornerstone, the iron fortification of our food. Now, fortification was only necessary to begin with because people weren't getting enough meat. They were transitioning to heme-poor diets that were filled up with refined grains, flours, and sugars. Now, these diets, in addition to being heme-poor, also tended to be filled up with things that inhibited the absorption of iron. Some things that can prevent the absorption of iron, phytic acid found in grains, legumes, and other plant foods, polyphenols found in tea, coffee, chocolate, and wine, and a friendly reminder right now, there is no such thing as an essential polyphenol. Egg protein from both the whites and the yolk. Minerals that compete with iron for absorption, that's calcium, zinc, magnesium, copper. Nuts, uh, certain herbs, peppermint and chamomile. Fiber, potentially, the jury's still out on that. But also a friendly reminder that fiber is not an essential nutrient either. The biggest thing that we can do to help promote the absorption of iron is consume vitamin C with a meal. We can add vitamin C to heme poor foods that are filled up with things that are inhibiting or preventing the absorption of iron. But what I want to get at here is this is not some traditional way of eating that is adding fruits and vegetables um, to grain based meals. In fact, this is a complex post-agricultural revolution way of eating that would be impossible in a traditional diet. When I see shit like this, it drives me crazy. What about phytic acid? Phytates, which are found in most plant foods, can reduce iron absorption by up to 80%. Some traditional processes such as fermentation, germination, and even soaking can activate phytases in cereal grains or flours, which then degrade phytic acid and improve iron absorption. Vitamin C consumed along with a meal can counteract the effect. In one study, preschoolers with iron deficiency anemia were given vitamin C supplements twice a day, 100 milligrams at each of two phytate-rich meals. After two months, most of the kids were no longer anemic. Not all of them, but most of them were no longer anemic. But here's the really annoying part. This underscores the importance of vitamin C. What? Many grains and legumes, including soy, can be good sources of iron if you consume them with vitamin C. What? <laughs> Wouldn't this underscore the importance of not eating foods with phytic acid in them? Like, isn't this just as much an argument against eating grains, soy, and legumes as it is for it adding vitamin C or adding fruit to your grain-based meal? Like, additionally, haven't we already established the fact that heme iron is superior to non-heme iron and preferentially absorbed in the human body? Ugh. Except, of course, for the one awesome exception that I promised vegan family we would talk about later in the video. Well, it's later in the video. So, what do we know now? 
we know that our need for heme iron specifically is real and not negotiable. Uh, we know that humans seem to be inclined to seek out sources of heme iron. We know that this is probably why these foods tend to taste better, heme containing foods. Think of uh, how beef tastes in relation to chicken. We also know that humans are in both inclined and able to use their big meat eating brains to solve problems. And lastly, because of this, this means that they're capable of doing super cool shit like using genetically modified yeast to make heme iron out of plants and put it into fake burgers. Remember how I left that statement previously qualified and said that heme iron's found nearly exclusively in animal flesh? There is more than just a teeny amount of heme iron in the Impossible Burger. It's nutritionally significant. The Impossible Burger is so realistic that longtime vegans who try to eat them actually struggle to do so. Um, it actually makes them physically sick. Lastly, for my carnivore family, should we be worried about iron overload? I think so. Pick up a copy of Dennis Mangan's uh, Dumping Iron, put it on your reading list, and make up your own mind about this. When you find paleo types, carnivore types, and vegans all agreeing on a nutritional hazard, even if in the case of vegans it's only accidental, um, I definitely think you should stand up and take notice of that fact. What I'll say is that all of us relaxed carnivores here, cool, chill, relaxed carnivores here, should do or should consider doing is taking advantage of the Red Cross. Give blood regularly and you'll get a fairly decent proxy for your iron levels. If you're a man and you're my age, I'm 37 now, 37 and a half, you're probably on your way to overload. But the good news is that each blood donation will drain you of about 200 to 250 milligrams of iron. Once you're disqualified from donating because your hemoglobin is too low, you're good. No, just kidding. <laughs> you're not good. You might be deficient at that point. So let's do it the right way and let's use a test. Um, Life Extension Foundation offers a serum ferritin test, which like I said above, is probably a pretty good way to tell about total iron stores. 28 bucks last time I checked. Check your iron and try to get that down into the very bottom of the acceptable reference range. So the final, what do we know? We know that iron is an essential element, but tricky to absorb. We know that heme iron is a special kind of iron that's found nearly exclusively in animal flesh and that it's preferentially absorbed by the human body. <clears throat> we know that the differences in the way that iron is absorbed is probably responsible for the iron deficiency diseases we see in vegans and vegetarians and the iron overload conditions that we see in meat eaters. We know that iron homeostasis is, uh, uh, is maintained at the point of absorption rather than the point of excretion because the body has a limited ability to excrete iron. We know that iron in excess of human needs is stored first as ferritin and then as hemosiderin. We know that because of the very nature of iron itself that this excess stored iron is dangerous in the human body and can be detrimental to human health if we store too much of it. We know that everybody should consider monitoring their iron level. We know that my vegan family should consider adding the Impossible Burger, TM, to their diets if a test indicates deficiency. We know that uh, my relaxed carnivore family should consider regular phlebotomy if a test indicates iron overload until they get their levels down to the lower end of the reference range. All right guys, thanks for sticking with me. Please hit that like and subscribe button. Smash, smash, smash. It's your boy Danny reminding you one last time to eat meat, move weight, and give blood. Let me know what you think down in the comments. Chuck a deuce.